Hello, and welcome to lecture number 33. This is our last in this series on depression. I'm very excited to be able to summarize some really interesting research about alternatives for both the treatment and prevention of depression. And so this is a really, uh, I think, exciting field uh, at this point. So, uh, one again, as always, remind you, if you or someone else you know is feeling depressed or suicidal, there's always help available. Please reach out to one of these resources should you need them. Uh, as always, again, these video lectures are for educational purposes. Please consult your physician or pharmacist for any questions about medications, uh, drugs you take, or before embarking on an exercise program, because that's one of the things we'll be talking about today. So, uh, we're now here at the point where we talk about alternatives to drug treatment and some possibilities for even preventing depression. So I want to start off by a quick reminder of some critical roles of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, and I'm going to also mention uh, cortisol a little bit as well, because these are two important parts uh, about how diet and exercise may be playing a role in um, prevention and treatment of depression finish out by talking about uh, regional transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial direct cortical stimulation uh, as potential alternatives to drug treatment as well. Uh, so let's start with brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, plasticity changes in the brain uh, associated with depression are also associated with BDNF. Uh, we talked about this in previous lectures, but several factors can modulate genetic expression of BDNF and BDNF levels in the brain. And so when we're talking about uh, trying to come up with interventions to improve the neurodegeneration from um, depression, what we want to do is th talk about trying to boost levels of, of BDNF. And so interventions designed with this in mind will be the most successful. The other thing to think about is the general cause of depression is stress, and that is caused by a release, uh, cortisol release uh, from the uh, adrenal glands. And if we can come up with interventions that reduce that release of cortisol or mitigate that release of cortisol, we can also potentially uh, prevent depression in the first place. So uh, let's keep that in mind. So we'll start with exercise. And this is one of the sort of most well-known uh, treatments for depression. Problem is, of course, when you are severely depressed, exercise is not probably going to happen. Um, but I will say, I think what's really important about this is uh, if you're somebody who exercises regularly, you're going to be um, sort of inoculated against uh, a sudden stressful experience and its potential to cause depression. Now, everyone's a little bit different, uh, but uh, I can say in my experience uh, in the times that I've not been able to get decent amounts of exercise and stressful events are happening, uh, they have really knocked me for a loop. And so I think... Uh, there's some really good peer-reviewed evidence uh, for the use of exercise in treating and preventing depression. So first off, regular leisure exercise of any intensity can provide protection against future depression. Going for walks, going for hikes, gardening, uh, any kind of exercise uh, that is leisurely uh, does provide protection against future depression. Bike riding. You know, this doesn't have to be um, lifting weights. This doesn't have to be going to aerobic fitness classes. Getting out and going for walks is also a really good protection against future depression. Uh, exercise has been shown to reduce cortisol releases in response to stress. So here's where we're getting at this idea of preventing future depression episodes by reducing that amount of cortisol that's released in response to stress. Uh, we've also seen that exercise increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor in humans. And again, this has been associated with repairing some of that neuronal damage caused by depression in the first place. And so exercise is a really a great way uh, to get at uh, some of these underlying neuronal issues. So we see exercise increases BDNF expression in the hippocampus and also has been shown to increase hippocampal volume. Uh, another good uh, piece of evidence that exercise has some really exciting effects uh, and positive effects on the brain. At reductions in cortisol release and increases in BDNF levels, and these are two important components to preventing and treating depression. Uh, in terms of a sort of fitness program for treating depression, this particular study showed daily interval treadmill training for 30 minutes for 10 days improved depression similar, symptoms similarly to pharmacotherapy. Um, and so this isn't a huge amount of exercise. It's 30 minutes a day. 
Um, and it was basic interval training where you run for a little bit, walk for a little bit, based on what the individuals were able to do. Uh, three times a week, moderate supervised aerobic activity for nine weeks can significantly improve depression in some patients. Um, so again, that supervised aerobic activity, sometimes that's what it takes is, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to this class three times a week, and I'm going to do that class. Whereas if you're trying to do it on your own, sometimes it doesn't work as well. Again, it's all about what works for you, but increasing your activity level is a really critical part of this. So the key here is engaging in moderate activity to the greatest extent possible. So Try to increase your level of activity, walk more, park a little further away at work or at the grocery store, um, try to walk to work, take transit, because oftentimes you have to walk more when it comes to transit. Any kind of moderate activity is really going to be important. You know, take the dog for a walk, um, take the kids out for a walk, whatever it is that you think um, you can do is uh, the greatest extent possible. I do want to note that extreme exercise can actually be harmful and lead to impaired cognitive performance. So these are things like marathon running, um, extreme, um, any kind of extreme sort of hiking, running, those, you know, mountain marathons, people that, you know, go and ride their bikes, you know, through the mountains for days at a time. That kind of extreme exercise can actually be harmful. And so you want to keep this moderate uh, because that's, it's certainly a far better, um, far better for you. So that's exercise, moderate exercise, um, very important. Let's get to diet. And diet's another important part of this. And there's actually a whole new area in nutritional psychology or nutri nutritional psychiatry trying to figure out how diet uh, is associated with um, our psych psychological function. So first off, a high fat refined sugar diet reduces hippocampal brain derived neurotrophic factor and plasticity. So that high fat refined sugar diet is going to be associated with disruptions in neuronal function in the hippocampus, a critical part of the brain uh, associated with uh, the ideology of depression. So that's the first off part of this, high fat refined sugar, definitely a bad idea. Second is intermittent fasting may promote plasticity and increase BDNF in the hippocampus. And this is an exciting part of sort of modern views on fasting, is that they actually do are associated with uh, improvements in a variety of areas, including health and brain health. And uh, one of the things we see in a variety of religions, in fact, almost all religions, uh, include oftentimes some component of fasting. Um, so we just not long ago finished um, the uh, Holy Days of Ramadan, um, which uh, Muslims fast from um, sunrise to sundown. Uh, the, of course, Lent is another uh, uh, thing associated with uh, oftentimes intermittent fasting, particularly on Fridays, alterations in diet on Fridays. Um, every major religion includes some sort of fasting component uh, and has been shown to uh, really improve brain uh, functioning. Again, intermittent fasting um, in a healthy way, but always talk to your doctor about these things. A third, a Mediterranean diet, um, which is generally lots of vegetables, fresh vegetables um, and fish with the addition of nuts. Um, nuts apparently are a very important uh, healthy fat, particularly walnuts, pecans, um, almonds, very uh, important type of healthy fat. This has been shown to increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor levels in depressed individuals. And so this type of Mediterranean diet uh, is a pretty great route to go. Lots of vegetables, fish, fish oil, um, and uh, olive oil, uh, very healthy fats are an important part of this. Uh, so some other notes on diet, a high intake of fast food and processed pastries, pastries have been associated with an increased risk of depression up to six years later. So here's one of the issues where we have to think about um, kids and what kids are eating um, without wading too far into the um, political morass of, <laughs> of high school food um, or school foods. One of the things we really want to think about is the kind of food kids are eating uh, and are we setting them up for an increased risk for depression later on in life? And I think that's a really important component we have to think about. So uh, the consumption of fish, vegetables, olive oil, and cereal grains has been correlated negatively with the association of depression symptoms. So the more fish, vegetables, olive oil, and whole grains you eat, uh, the less likely uh, you are to have those kind of depression symptoms. 
And then finally, what we call the Western diet is associated with significantly reduced hippocampal volume. So this is this sort of processed food, high sugar, high fat, um, kind of you know basic you know U.S. diet you might think of, heavy on red meat, has been associated with uh, reduced hippocampal volume. So we have to really think about how our diet is having an effect on our brain as well. And so diet and exercise <sighs> sounds overly simplistic, but the data behind this is so good uh, that I, I can't emphasize enough that these are two really terrific interventions to think about um, in terms of both preventing depression, but also if you know you're going to be under a high level of stress, this may be trying to build this into your diet uh, as much as you can it is, I think, important. So finally, omega-3 fish oil has shown some benefit in treating depression. Uh, again, that's associated with that Mediterranean diet, and that you can take as a supplement. Uh, the data behind it's good-ish, um, and certainly it's not going to hurt you, and has actually been shown to have some other benefits as well. Uh, and so it's, a, it's certainly something I would consider adding. So that's diet. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a form of brain stimulation therapy used to treat depression and anxiety. Lots of people are finding success with this particular treatment. About 25% of patients. Uh, it's a safe, well-tolerated procedure uh, and has been shown to increase those BDNF levels we were talking about. And so this is a much um, safer version of what we used to call, you know, it used to be electroconvulsive therapy where we would induce grand mal seizures, very dangerous procedure. Um, some people did find success with it, but uh, T RTMS, painless, um, relatively, relatively safe, a well-tolerated procedure. Um, I've had students who've told me they've had great success with this particular type of procedure. So look for a clinic near you if that's something you're interested in. Uh, transcranial direct current stimulation does have promise for the treatment of ma major depressive disorder. Uh, it's been shown to modulate cortical excitability and inducing long-lasting effects, and also appears to moderate uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor as well. Now, I do want to say, do this under the supervision of a doctor. Do not do this at home with your own kit. So TDCS is one of these things that you can find instructions for how to do online. And this is not something to play around with, particularly when it comes to your brain. And so do this under uh, medical supervision. Uh, but there is some, uh, some exciting data about that as well. So I want to provide some concluding thoughts about uh, this idea of alternatives and preventing uh, depression. Moderate exercise appears to be very critical in uh, maintaining neuronal health as is a healthy diet, and particularly combining with that with exercise appears to be the best preventative measure. And so I think that's something to think about. And one of the things I always encourage people to do is not be hypnotized by the complexity of trying to alter their life and diet altogether, but try to make small changes. Start getting a little more exercise. Change one meal a day to something that's a little bit healthier, or at least you know a couple times a week. Try to say, you know what, we're going to have um, we're going to have a smoked salmon salad today uh, instead of uh, you know fried chicken or um, steak. So try to incorporate more healthy alternatives into your diet, uh, and you know you can do some really great things with nuts and salads and all sorts of great stuff. So think about that. Uh, and the conclusion here is there are numerous potential alternatives to antidepressant drug treatment. Um, for you to think about. So if it's not something you want to do, a lot of people are hesitant to go on antidepressant, there are certainly options available. And so talk with your doctor about those um, and think about incorporating some of these healthier alternatives into your life. As always, uh, check out these uh, resources for uh, more information should you need them. Thank you very much. And we'll be back next time uh, with uh, lectures on bipolar disorder.